Good morning. Again here. Welcome. Let a few more people come in here or trying to get into the room and we'll go ahead and get started. Right. Um, I've got some uh, slides for you in a few minutes, but I just wanted to introduce myself. So I'm David, uh, David Drake, and um, I'm glad you're here this morning. We're going to share a little bit about our narrative coach program and see what uh, questions we might ask here for you. So just would love to hear from you. Where are you calling in from today? And um, yeah. Who do we have here? I'm happy to dive in. Hi, David. Yeah, Hi. Hi, I'm Jackie. I'm in Cumbria in the northwest of England. Okay. Welcome. Good to be with you all. Thank you. Hey, David. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Judah. Judah Lynn. I'm calling from uh, Washington, D.C. area, Gaithersburg, Maryland, near uh, your uh, colleague, Allison Whitmire. Yes. So I found out you. So I'm really happy to be here. Wonderful. And you have a really fancy background. I'm coveting your penthouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love this background. Yeah. It yeah. makes me feel good. And Betty, I saw your hand up. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I'm I'm calling from uh, Hudson, Massachusetts. Okay. Wonderful. Anybody else want to say hello? Uh, hey, I'm Jess Hall and I'm uh calling from Washington, DC. So not too far from Judah. All right. You're disguising your penthouse background, so. <laughs> it's just a plain old whiteboard, <laughs> nothing fancy. Just kidding. All right. Hmm. Anybody else? All right. Um, I'll, I'll ask you a little bit more in a bit about specifically what you're looking for from today, so we make sure that we get all your questions answered, but. For now, let's just put up a few slides so I can share a few things. Um, here we go. Oh, there's Justine, wonderful. Um, so the thing that I always find, I've, I've been teaching this work for a long time, but the thing that draws me back every year, not, not just the work itself, but the quality of the people who choose to show up, um, and they're often people that have um, either come from other fields and are trying to find a kind of a path in coaching that makes sense to them and or have been in coaching for a while and um, see some of the limits in the way coaching is traditionally taught. And so um, I always sort of laugh at myself and say that you're the reason I came, you came, but um, you all are the reason you stay uh, because you meet other kindred spirits who are kind of seeking a different path um, for kind of what the world needs now from, uh, from our work. <clears throat> and one of the ways that I um, bring that is uh, using an old fashioned sort of carousel. And it feels like uh, in our profession of coaching, it's tempting to want to guess, like what are gonna be the in colors this year? What are the in uh, trends or fads or theories or um, but it felt like for me, it was missing the larger point that um, we're just sort of repainting the same horses and failing to recognize they're going around in a circle uh, and uh, sort of tied down to kind of one role, one uh, movement. Um, and I feel like a lot of what narrative coaching is trying to do is to liberate even more potential from coaching and sort of set ourselves to be freer and not tied down to it has to be this way, it has to look like this, um, so that we each can bring both our unique um, character to coaching, but also that we're freer to kind of morph ourselves in the course of a session, depending on what's actually happening. Um, and so I'm just gonna invite, uh, so there is a structure, there is theory, it's incredibly grounded as a methodology, but ultimately it's about liberating yourself to be able to show up in some new ways uh, for, um, your clients. And I say that because, um, and, and you'll notice this if you choose to come join us, that the first like third of the program isn't in some ways even about coaching, it's about yourself. Um, and we, I say that because um, 
I really firmly believe that we can only travel as far with our clients as we have gone ourselves. It doesn't mean we have had to have all the exact same experiences than, as they do or know everything about their, uh, their field or their career, or, but it means as a human being that we've ventured into places that help us mature. And so if you've never, um, you know, if you've noticed in yourself, you kind of avoid really dealing with grief very well, and you have a client who's had a significant loss, it's going to be really difficult for you to coach them because you've not lived in that for yourself. And so we just find that the more confident we get in ourselves as human beings, the easier it is to do coaching. And, um, and this particular picture is my constant reminder of this quote, because um, I had gone back to um, one of my favorite uh, activities as a youth was to go backpacking in the mountains in California where I'd grown up. And uh, so this is a picture from one of my last trips just a few years ago. And um, one of the destinations for this particular part of the hike was uh, an extraordinarily beautiful alpine lake at the base of some, some quite tall mountains. So I was really kind of psyched to get, get there and camp and, you know, sort of uh, relive some wonderful memories from my youth. And um, uh, when I got to, and I'm really good at maps, so I thought, oh, this will be easy. When I got to the region where there, uh, where there was supposed to be a lake, there was nothing. There wasn't even a creek. And I, 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 first I was kind of panicked. Like, did I just completely mess up the map or what has happened here? But then I started looking at the different um, mountains and things around me. And I realized what had happened was that climate change had wiped out all the glaciers. And so the water that once had fed the lake was now gone. Um, and, and so for me then, so I actually ended up camping um, where this picture was taken. But I'd had to kind of, because I had been all along that day, assuming that um, that everything was fine, I had to make some detours and some kind of more difficult parts of uh, hikes I had not remembered. And I realized in hindsight, it was because the topography had changed because of the lack of snow and water. And so, and for me, it became this great metaphor about how we get stuck in our own maps of how we think the world is supposed to be or how we think the world is. Um, and oftentimes we get attached to that and we just sort of march into that as opposed to paying attention to what's actually happening around us. So in the program, we teach a lot about how to notice more of what's actually happening in front of us um, because that for, uh, then for me gives us far more information uh, to help um, with our clients. Um, so for now, um, I'm just really curious and then we'll just kind of uh, move into some of the content about the program. But I'm just going to take this down for a minute and see what brought you here today. Like, what intrigues you or interests you about narrative coaching for yourself? And welcome to Justine. I'll, I'll jump in, Dave. I, I, I almost don't know where to start. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. I almost don't know where to start. It's kind of like, you know, everything you, everything you said, especially just, um, yeah, I don't know where to start. Something about presence, I think. And again, you know, my, uh, my connection to you came from um, Alison Whitmire mm -hmm. and uh, just this whole idea of, um, I heard, I've been interested in coaching from a very um, practical results oriented kind of um, place i've been a, like a, a gymnast and martial artist and dancer and very uh, good at mm -hmm. accomplishing things and really fascinated with process and workflows and things like that mm -hmm. but uh, and at the same time very involved in a spiritual path and uh, meditation particularly qigong you know in, inner mm -hmm. inner work and uh and so I, i've i think i've been you know working on my tool you know so to speak and sharpening my saw yeah. And there's just really this sense of really, okay, I really want to give something, really something of value. And um, mm. and I almost discounted what it was that I, I, I sort mm. of have as most valuable, you know, which is who I am, if that makes sense. <laughs> and, and the idea of, um, in fact, I, I, I'll, I'll share this and then, and, and then, and then uh, give over the, the talking space of, uh, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Tonglen, the uh, idea of like, sending and taking, um, sending mm -hmm. out, bringing in suffering of others, sending out, you know, love. 
one way of saying it. And I remember talking to my sister saying, you know, we're talking about career. And I said, I, I would just like to just be able to do that all the mm. time. In fact, it's even said that that practice is, is mm. what, um, having a Buddhist background, that is the practice of a Bodhisattva is, is taking taking and giving or the practice of a Buddha, mm. is, you know, taking, suffering, giving. And, and somehow this work is like, oh, I could just kind of do that <laughs> in a way. I can just be. Yeah receive and give mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that's that's my sharing about why okay I'm well thank you Judah and Rima I saw your hand up yeah um yeah. uh much of I think my story is very similar to what you described of people who are um, coming from different um maybe backgrounds and mm -hmm. uh, uh landed in coaching but felt coaching isn't fitting right wondering is it right for me maybe it isn't mm -hmm. and then i heard you talk and i realized oh you know it can be so much else mm -hmm. other than these very strict rules mm -hmm. and i'm very intrigued to learn about your programs okay. um yeah so that's where i'm here great well welcome hi justine hi david I, did you want to share? Uh, I, I'm i here. Uh, it just feels like the next step for me. I'm mm -hmm. um, interested to continue learning with you and, and mm -hmm. the growth that follows. Okay. Yeah. Justine's in our other program at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Hello. Maybe I could be next. Yes, Pavel. Yeah. Did I say yeah. it correctly? Yeah, it's Pavel. Okay. Uh, yeah, so David, actually, first I would like to say, like, it's so strange to communicate now with you in person since uh, for the last couple, I would say, like, couple of months, I've been watching a couple of your interviews and mm. presentations, and it was like the same screen, but it was a recording. <laughs> and now, like, here, here's like the same person, but you really are relaxed. Uh, I do exist, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> you respond to what I say. It's it's just some kind of like 21st mm. century magic. <laughs> so um actually um I was excited when I like figure out first about your book on narrative coaching and I, I started well reading the first chapters of it and then I figure out okay, like yeah, I need to take a step back and maybe figure out like more about the, in a more presentation type of way what it is since two years I'm in coaching and it seems that it fits uh, how I understand coaching since uh, I, I would say I had a quite a difficult time finding clients and maybe because of my persistence in understanding what coaching is mm. I, I didn't want to be like a false prophet who doesn't really feel what they are bringing to, mm -hmm. to to other people and it seems that well i'm now in a in a place and with a well some capabilities that kind of let me be grounded in mm -hmm. coaching and it feels like well the approach that you present adds greatly to what i'm seeking mm -hmm. so that's why i'm here yeah You'll hear me if you join the program. You'll hear me say this a number of times, but my most frequent feedback to participants and people in workshops is I invite them to please stop coaching uh, because they're missing the vast majority of what's actually happening right in front of them because they're so eager to coach. Um, and I feel like um, I've been at yeah, this for about 25 years. Um, I feel like coaching is at this huge inflection point, and part of it is reimagining what um, what coaching even is. And um, so, and I, I see your note, Natasha. So yeah, that's fine. If we can communicate through the chat box, and all will be good. All right. Anybody else want to share? Jackie, you're on mute. Thank you. I would like to, but I can see Betty's unmuted as well. And Betty, I didn't want to jump in ahead of you. Did you? Ah, okay. Um, uh, you know, when you end up somewhere and you're not quite sure how you got there. Oh. Yeah. I think I've got a little bit of that going on, but the essence for me 
I think linking back to what Judah said about presence, I've coached for, for a decade. And the more I coach, the less I feel like I know what I'm doing, but not in a good way. And mm. so I think the more trainings I've been on and the more skills and tools I've learned, the further I've got from presence. Mm. And um, I'm halfway through somatic experiencing training mm-hmm. um, in Peter Levine's work. And I think I thought that going the therapeutic route was going to give me mm. more of what I was seeking. But actually, it doesn't feel that the therapeutic world f- doesn't feel as nourishing and alive for me as coaching does. Mm. Um, but so I think there's something about the more I've learned how to not be in survival mode, like I'm missing most of what's going on if I'm in fight or flight, right, or freeze. Yeah. So it really resonates thinking about you saying, uh, being in presence and and, mm. and trusting what is unfolding. So, mm-hmm. um, but I, I actually honestly don't know how I got to be on this call today. I'm glad that I am. But, well, here you are. Um, yeah, so um, it's attempting in our work with so many choices to want to keep consuming. Um, and um, my experience is the world is drowning in consumption and we don't need any more consumption. Um, and so we, I, you know, oftentimes people feel like I need to go get all this stuff and then I can go bring all that stuff to coaching. But I would say the other way around, go to coaching and see what you actually need. And if you attract or find yourself with clients that are beyond your capacity, either refer them or get better at what they need. Uh, but to use, it's sort of, um, yeah, it's, um, it, for me, it's a much um, a lighter way to go. Um, the, one of the participants in one of my early workshops, uh, Heather uh, Plett from Canada, went on to do a lot of great work on holding space. Um, so she, her observation of her experience in my workshop, she wrote this a great um, uh, analogy, a great uh, sort of um, parable, which is actually in the book. I got her permission to put it in the book. And I, I want my clients to feel like we're sitting on a park bench and we're having a chat. They can put their heavy knapsack down, all the crap they're carrying, all the things they thought they were supposed to have or be or do, and just rest their feet. And then the magic of the work is when they get up, they start to notice, wow, this pack is so much lighter. What happened? And um, so that's the uh, the sensation we want to leave with people is um, almost a minimalist approach to coaching that only brings what's absolutely necessary and nothing else. So I, I, I used to frustrate a lot. Of, I used to teach a lot and do um, like guest lectures and sessions for graduate coaching programs. And it was very frustrating for the students often because they would give me feedback to say, you just sat there and you did nothing. And yet the clients seem to have amazing experiences. How does that happen? <laughs> I said, the point of coaching is not our talking. Um, the point of coaching is that what the journey the client's on and they don't need a lot of words from you. So um, Jessica, and then we'll come back to uh, Jackie. Oh, Jackie's clapping. <laughs> Jessica, what brought you here? Uh, I guess I have a little bit of a different background than most of the folks I've here, which is always nice to have a mix of people, right? Um, I'm a designer mm-hmm. by trade. And so I do product design and worked in technology companies my whole career. Uh, about a year ago, I took a, a coaching program um, with BetterUp and thought, mm-hmm. wow, this is eventually what I want to do with my life, but it's not what I do today. <laughs> um, but I have a background in design and writing and strategy. And so I use story a lot and thinking about mm. um, how to craft a strategy, how to design a product. And so I was really kind of intrigued and like, oh, that's interesting because there's always that story you're telling yourself and how does mm-hmm. that mean? So um, so yeah, quite a, a lot less experience of coaching than some of the distinguished folks on the, on the group pair today. Right. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and share again, and um, we'll come back to this. Okay. Well, it's over there again already. <clears throat> right. So I'm just gonna share a few things about um, just a couple of slides about one of many things that makes uh, narrative coaching uh, unique, and. Um, and then we'll actually give you a chance to practice this so, so you can experience it for yourself 
And the good news is it, we, I've given you four questions you can use in the practice. So even if you knew nothing about coaching, you can do be fabulous at the exercise. Um, but I, I also, it's always good to start out with a little coaching humor. So um, it's up here, so it does it right. There we go. Um, so let's just see a little humor in here. So one of the things I'm most known for is um, we don't tend to set very many goals in narrative coaching. And we'll talk a lot about that in the program. And I've debated all kinds of scholars around the world about goals and the way they're overused in coaching. But in reality, just like the person is drowning in the ocean, uh, our clients often need many, many things long before they get near goals. Um, and I think oftentimes coaches create agendas and goals to manage their own discomfort more than because it's actually useful for the client. Um, and so this is the way that coaching is traditionally taught. We, we're taught, you know, coaches, most coaches are taught to focus on, you know, you've got to have a lot of powerful questions. You've got to ask great questions, which are great. You know, having, it's better to be good at questions than not. Um, but, and then, but in the, Typical dynamic, we ask questions, the client thinks about our questions, eventually they answer our questions. We listen to their answers, we kind of formulate our thinking and our response, and then we ask another question. And if we're not careful, it ends up being sort of like a loving interrogation. But you'll notice that the whole momentum and the whole direction, while ostensibly it's theoretically client-centered, is really driven by our questions. And then what happens is it, as you get into the more the complexity of a client's issues or the emotions of a client's issues, um, you know, things start to really build. And then you, if you're the coach and you're coming from this paradigm, there's a lot to start keeping track of, a lot to pay attention to, a lot to remember. And so you get farther and farther in your head and you pretty much already have the next question formed before they even finish talking. Or you panic because, oh my God, I don't have any more questions. What am I gonna do now? And so it, it puts enormous amount of pressure on the coach. It puts the responsibility for the conversation on the coach. Um, and it tends to, even when the questions are effective, if this is your only or your primary strategy, it ends up um, sort of in a, in a funny way, even if the client gains some insights, ends up disempowering them because you're the one that drove the entire conversation. And we do that often because we feel pressure, especially if we're coaching in organizations, we want to deliver outcomes and results, and we're supposed to be doing all these things and be useful and be helpful and all of our own stories about who we think we're supposed to be. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with this process. It only becomes challenging for me personally and professionally when that's the default that most coaches start from and stay in. Because most of the time, I'm not doing this. Um, and so this is what how I think about, um, yeah, so then we focus on uh, ourselves as the coach and our methodology. And one of the consistent pieces of research from psychotherapy, which I think also applies in coaching, but it's newer, so we don't have as much evidence, is that of the four com common sort of elements of coaching with um, the client and the coaching relationship being the other two, the coach and the methodology have almost no impact on outcomes. I mean, in the sense of um, the particular methodology we use. Um, and, and we in narrative coaching try to go where the evidence goes, which is the vast majority of the variables for outcomes in coaching have to do with the client and factors in the client's life. Um, and so if you're going to be truly client-centered, which coaches profess to be, then we have to get ourselves out of the driver's seat and out of the... Um, feeling responsible for the entire conversation. So we're gonna focus on some other things. So this is what we look at in narrative coaching. So if I start in the center, our attention in the session is on the field. So the field is sort of the energetic space, the, the container that you've created in working together and the quality of the relationship. That's where we focus the vast majority of our energy. How is this person showing up? What are we noticing about the story they're choosing to bring to, into the field? What factors from outside the coaching relationship are impacting their ability to be here? What is the quality of our relationship? So um, 
yes, we have a professional responsibility to provide leadership in a coaching session, but our primary job for me is as a witness. So we're witnessing what we're seeing the client say, do, um, how they hold their body, what their face looks like, uh, the words and metaphors they choose in their stories. And we're helping them next by helping them inquire into their experience about what we're noticing. And so they're so now they're they get to decide where they want to go and what they what feels important to them based on what we've helped them see in themselves or about themselves. Um, and then they're based on their inquiry of them into the moment, into themselves, they narrate that experience out loud which often is quite novel for them. They often hear themselves saying things that it realize were true, were true for them. And then we listen and observe you know, their narration, and then we witness that back to them. And so it doesn't mean that we can't use questions because sometimes questions are very helpful and very timely. It just means that the, what we're working with is the material in the stories the client has chosen to share. Because they've out of the hundreds of thousands of stories they could tell, they've chosen these. And they've chosen to tell them in this way at this time. So I'm really curious, why? What, what is that story trying to get our attention around? Um, and so for me, this takes, so my energy is not spent worrying about my next question. My, my uh, energy is spent, how do I remain as present as possible to the field that we're in? And what am I noticing about that that might give us some clues about what, what we need to pay attention to in the session itself. So I'm just going to stop there for a minute and see if there's any thoughts or questions, and I'm going to let you practice this for yourself so you can see what this feels like. Okay? But for now, is there anything you'd like to ask or share? Um. Actually, I, I do have one like, okay. thought. Um, yes. Um, when when I hear about well, such a high awareness, demanding processes, right? So feeling the field, being over a relationship, uh, like mm -hmm. in the relationship. So um, I try to connect with what you said in one of the presentations about this. Uh, maturities like a different yeah. maturities mm -hmm. that a coach has to be mindful of so but what what would you suggest for people who realize that certain maturities are not that mature <laughs> and but they as coaches like are somewhere in the beginning of that way yeah um <clears throat> so the like i said the first um about third of the program is, um, so Pavel's re referring to, um, I'm working this major project for, with the Institute of Coaching at Harvard and um, on called the five maturities. And it started out as a project to help decouple um, coaching's obsession with competency models, which are actually a very tiny sliver of what it takes to be a great coach. And uh, so we spend a lot of time in the, like I said, the first third of the program focusing on the first two maturities, which is personal maturity and what I think of as spiritual maturity. And I mean spiritual with a very small s, and it, it, there's a lot of different ways to get at that one. But the, the personal maturity is your, is your capacity. Like, what can you draw from in yourself? Like I said, if you tend to really struggle being with grief, and somebody, a client shows up who's lost their job, you don't, you're not gonna be able to bring much from your from of yourself to that because you've avoided that topic uh, in your own life. So the personal maturity is helping you become more comfortable with who you are and and what you can draw from. And this is for people, I mean, coaching is a new profession. So we all got here from someplace else. So what of your past careers would be helpful to you in coaching? Spiritual maturity has to do with what you can see. So again, one of the, um, the I think the greatest uh, assets for a narrative coach is we tend to notice way more than most coaches because we're not worried about what we're supposed to be doing next. And so we use a lot of things around the somatic experience of telling a story. We work a lot with, um, in some ways, um, 
the energy that's generated by a story. We work a lot with what we call serious play. So we work with characters in stories and we bring them into the room and we work with them because um, uh, we will explain why in the program, but um, yeah. And so part of it is um, coming to trust yourself. Although wherever you are in the journey is fine. And um, it's, there's always more to do. There's always more to grow. Um, and so for some of you, the first third of the program will be a reminder of like for you, Judah, things you've studied for a long time. It will be very familiar to you. For those of you, this will be brand new and that'll be fine too, because that, that'll be your journey to be on. And you can learn from others in the program as well, who are maybe a little bit ahead, but it's all fine. You, even it is, it's not a comparison. There is no race. You can do narrative coaching and not have a lot of this. It just more, but one of the biggest things that we want to get across in the program is that your maturity will matter more to your progress as a narrative coach than the tools and skills you remember. And so whatever that journey looks like for you is the one you need to be on and it's totally fine. Um, there is no contest, there is no prize at the end, it's just you. And whatever you need to be doing for yourself to be in the program, um, I would say that we just finished a cohort and um, we have our graduation tomorrow. Um, and this cohort's like all the others that many of them report, you know, I, I'm really appreciative of what we've learned, but I'm more valuing who I became in the course of the program. And so what that will look like will be different for each of you, depending on the journey that you want to be on. Um, does that help? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. All good? All right. So here, we'll give you um, a, um, a chance to practice. So we do this, uh, you'll, we'll do this again in the class, but I, I wanted to bring this forward just as a way for you to start getting a sense of this yourself rather than just my words. So um, this will not um, feel like a, um, a full coaching session, so don't try to make it one. I want you just to focus on what it feels like to just ask these questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you into pairs and I'm going to ask one of you just to, we don't need the story. We need just a headline so we don't have time for everything, but uh, something that you're working on in your own life. Just again, the one sentence headline. And then here's the four questions. So if you're the other person, we're just going to do this one direction for the sake of time. We'll have plenty of time to play with this in the program. I want you just to ask them these four questions, one at a time. And if you're receiving the question, uh, just be quiet for a second and then say one or two things that emerge for you. You're not, again, you're not gonna tell the whole story. You're not gonna try to solve any problems. I want you just to feel like what it's like to be in a narrative coaching conversation with um, fewer, simpler questions, okay? All right, so just give me a minute. Um, and we'll get these um, set up for you. Break our rooms. Oh, perfect. Excellent. And like I said, I'm just going to give you 10 minutes. So just for you to have some fun with this. Actually, I'll probably just give you eight minutes. Um, yeah. Give you 10. Um, there we go. So enjoy. See you soon. <clears throat> There. All right. I'm going to take this down for a minute. And um, so I'm just curious what your experience was in your brief excursion into narrative coaching. Uh, David, your camera is not on. And it is on, but for some reason it's not working. There you are. Yeah, I, I froze and nothing was happening. I thought that was kind of strange. Okay. So, yeah, Rima. Well, uh, I'm not sure I, I have my thoughts collected about it, but it was a very nice and interesting process with Pavel. Hmm. He, he 
I didn't think these questions would lead anywhere, but they really did. They really did. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't even sure what the questions were asking, but somehow just the suggestion of mm. a question mm. seemed to to work really well for me. So mm, good. that was a great experience with Pavel. He's very good. Mm, wonderful. Um, yeah, one of the things about um, um, this work is that we pay a lot of attention to what is this person ready for right now. When clients work really, coaches work really hard, they stir up all kinds of stuff, most of which the person is not ready or interested in talking about or isn't going to go anywhere. And you've all these sort of particles floating around in the air, you know, from a, a um, just got from a design perspective, there'd be like random stuff in a document that don't that detract from the main message. Um, you don't really need them. And uh, we find that keeping things simpler, focusing on fewer things at once, um, just especially now these days really helps um, people quite a bit. Are there experiences you wanna share? Yeah, Jessica and I had a lovely conversation mm -hmm. and uh, we were able to to switch and do both roles and I okay. was able to yeah. learn a little bit more about her and, and it mm. was a lovely conversation. Mm. Mm. Okay. I would love to. Especially, is it, okay? is it okay if I share? I'll only share from my experience. Um, we whispered a little because of sleeping baby. And so it brought this beautiful quality to the questions on top mm -hmm. of it. It actually, it brought something new from a presence point of view, mm -hmm. but it felt gentle and there was ease and it was generative as well. Mm -hmm. I was on the receiving end of Nastasia's questions. So it was generating new, something new was emerging in me mm -hmm. that I wasn't necessarily expecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the frames that came, uh, the narrative coaching came from was my background in Jungian psychology. And so we then look at the story as um, as a character in itself. And so the story's trying to get our attention for something. It's there for a reason. Out of all the, th you know, many cho choices they had about the story, they chose this one in this way at this time. And so we're all, we, and we because the story is basically an extension of the person, uh, particularly of their unconscious and so if we bring that into the room the coach uh, the client starts to see themselves in a new way because that part of themselves is externalized in the story that they can now look at um yeah so it's quite fun to just uh, be able to work that way anybody else and then we'll otherwise we'll move on so i want to share um just i'll uh, share my screen again i just want to share a few of the kind of core building blocks of um and this work, and then we'll talk about the details of the program itself. So what's it like to be a narrative coach? I think it's fabulous, but um, so I find a lot of coaches come to narrative coaching like this poor woman on the left. They're dragging all this stuff with them and they're gonna add narrative coaching on top of it. That's like, it's like a nine scoop ice cream cone. Um, and if, and plus if you're gonna carry a large rock, you should wear more sensible shoes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and I'd rather, so I, many of our participants come in to varying degrees feeling like the woman on the left and leave feeling like the woman on the right. Um, and a lot of that is we um, invite you to put down a lot of things you thought were essential for coaching that in my view are not. Um, so you can be free to whatever is coming next in the, with the client that you're actually talking to. Um, there's, um, as if you've ever had read the book or tried to read the book, it's, you know, I put in there all the documentation for where all this came from. So it's a heavily researched body of work. And that's just to show you kind of its origin origins, not that you should memorize it. There's no tests on the book. Um, and we want you to use that and learn that and then put it away uh, and be able to travel like the woman on the right. Another analogy that this is probably the first analogy I ever used in teaching this work um, is that we act like a tugboat. Uh, and, you know, a client is trying to ch often change something. They're like a large ship, uh, a cruise ship, container ship, 
and you're in a small little boat. So you're never going to be able to push it around randomly. You're not going to be able to tell it where to go. But through the, your, these tugs are built with very um, low, uh, deep, low motors. They understand physics and geometry. Um, and they're able to help these larger, much larger ships navigate in and out of ports, for example. So that's what we're doing. We're nudging our clients through our presence with them. And one of the big assumptions we make is that we're not making anything happen in coaching. There's a change process that's underway in the client. It was underway before they got there. It'll be underway after they leave. And we're trying to understand what nudges can I offer them now that keeps them going along their path to see where they're actually going. But when we realize that it's the client's change process, it's already happening. It again, it uh, takes away some of the efforting to try to make something happen. Um, the vast majority of what happens for a client in terms of successful change happens outside the session. And so a lot of our work then is how do we put things in motion so they can support themselves in between sessions or after sessions? Because that's where, again, people either rise or fall compared to what they uh, set out to do. So, these, I just want to share these briefly. We, could, you know, we spend a whole uh, nine months unpacking all these, but these are sort of the six principles that sort of started narrative coaching in the first place. The first one is the one we come back to again and again, and it's the most important principle in narrative coaching. Trust that everything you need is right in front of you. So if, especially in the beginning, so for those of you who are newer to coaching and you're in practices in class, and you're all of a sudden, it's your turn to coach, and you, I, don't, I haven't learned enough. I'm not ready for this. If you get lost, if you get confused, if you get upset, if you get distracted, just come back to the first principle. Everything you need is right in front of you. Get out of your head. Get out of your own anxiety. And just be present to what do I notice about what's right in front of me. And, and for me, this is just a really powerful liberation. And it just keeps us oriented about, for me, what matters most about coaching. <clears throat> we try to be present to what is. Um, we don't spend a lot of time about what should be or could be or would be, but we start with what is. And you'll see this in the model when you learn that. But And we try to do so without judgment um, so that clients feel safe to be fully themselves with us. Um, and then the third one here about your stance as a coach is speak only when you can improve on silence. So a little tip of the hat to Ram Das who sort of made that legendary but it's we have incorporated that in our um in the way we think about coaching and the reality is that um if we can only speak when we can improve on silence it's not as often as we think um so a lot of our time is spent in silence um allowing the work to do itself i mean to, to for things to work themselves out um, and so what, when you free yourself from having to talk a lot in coaching, you start to notice more in yourself and in the field, in the client, you start to realize that silence is not the absence of talking. It's a energy in itself. And that's something that we use quite a bit. Your stance with clients. So these are three things that sort of are really sort of elemental to narrative coaching. One is we're not interested in lots of psychological explanations. We could have them, and some of that might be useful for some clients. But mostly what we're trying to do is help them to generate experiences. So my observation is that in the other body of work um, in our ID program, which is where Justine is right now, one of the core sources for the material was the work of Maria Montessori, and some from Moshe Feldenkrais as well. Um, what adults lack and actually children lack now because of the way most schools are structured, is a safe place to practice. We're expected to learn and then do, and then be tested. And so we spend an enormous amount of money on leadership programs and training programs and, <clears throat> and, um, and even have role plays and things. But, but in terms of helping people really experience other ways of being and talking and standing in the world. We just don't give people that safe space. And so it's no wonder that most of what they think they've learned doesn't stick. So I just tell my clients, there's nobody on the planet that loves you more than I do right now in this hour. And we'll be here for you and whatever that you need. And so um, I'm trying to help them discover parts of themselves 
that would be useful for what it is they're trying to achieve. And I tell them, if you can't do it here with me, you're not going to do it when you go back to work. You just won't. It's too much pressure to go back to your old self. And so we have a lot of fun in our coaching. There's a lot of laughter and, um, and, and tears and a variety of other things. But in, in, again, all of this will seem, uh, may seem like big or novel. Um, but again, it's not, there's not a destination. This is more of a philosophy. Um, we work with, with directly with the narrative elements in the field. Again, we all can see, we can all can feel, we all can notice. So it helps us to, again, quiet ourselves. So we can be more like the lady on the bicycle. And then lastly, we um, can show up when our clients are trying to make big choices, when we see that change is happening in their stories um, and, um, and show up and be supported. So we have a whole module on on the whole on the change process that's in, um, embedded in the narrative coaching model. Um, so I'm just going to share two more. Um, if you've got a question, maybe uh, just hold on to it for a second. I've got two more brief slides, and then I want to stop and see what you think about all this. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll let you read this. Um, So, I'll, you know, um, if, if you join the program, you'll hear this story again, but I, I, I want to just tell you the story of this photograph, because it makes this point in a really powerful way. Um, so this, I used to do a lot of photography, and this was taken, this is completely untouched. I've done anything to this photo. Um, this was back in the analog film days. I was traveling uh, in Peru, and we were... Um, um, on our way to pick up some sacred stones at a, a space. And I was sort of at a crossroads in my life and in my career. And um, it was um, just a couple of years after narrative coaching had started. And I'm just trying to figure out what, what it, I, I saw a lot of potential, but I wasn't quite sure what, kind of where to begin. So I spent two weeks in the mountains of Peru to try to get a sense of what was being asked. And so we went down to the river. And um, one of the things I love is photographing the geometries and colors and lights of rivers. And um, so I'd gotten a few rocks from by the river for the, the piece we were going to do. And I, I noticed that the sun kind of broke through the clouds and was kind of shining into the river. And so I just started taking photographs. And, you know, um, unlike now, um, there's no like digital viewfinder and things where you can see how it looks right away. It's you take it and then you pray that something will come out of this in a way. Um, this is not what I saw through my viewfinder at all. I do, I can tell you that. And <clears throat> so when I got this film, the film back, the, the prints back, I was just stunned because my, um, my uh, purpose for the trip or my main mantra for the trip was that I, I realized that I needed to be more courageous and open my heart yeah, to allow it to come to the world which you can't quite see because it's a little bit cropped on the slide here. But you can see on the right-hand side of the picture, there's something that looks like a hand. There's actually a counterpart on the left. So the heart is being held by these hands in the river. I did not see this in my camera, but this is what turned up for me. And, this, and I thought, so I'm going to use this. So I didn't go seeking heart-related things in the, on my trip. But it was already present anyways. And so that, you know, maybe that's a little esoteric for some of you, I don't know, but uh, for me, it's just, I've continually surprised when I and, and others relax into narrative coaching, what becomes available, it, it sort of hides from us if we try too hard to do a good job coaching. Um, and that silence I find managed well and done well is actually quite fertile for people far more than they realize not leaping into the discomfort with another question or another comment or some other next step, but actually just be with uh, sort of, um, you know, what we think of as pregnant pauses and really touching moments and things that where the client's trying to find the words and trying to find the courage to say the words, 
even if it's about small things. And so just trusting that whatever um, is there is going to make itself known, particularly if we stop talking. Okay. And the last piece I'll share about this, um, uh, and then we'll, we'll see what's on your mind. <clears throat> So fortunately, Albert's long gone, but uh, so I've pretty significantly paraphrased his original comment, but I like the basic gist of what he was saying. Um, and so again, our job is not so much to be the perfect coach. Our job is to um, help the person we're coaching find their own inner wisdom, their own inner healer, their own, whatever it is, whatever frame works for you. Um, we're trying to help them activate that and access that so they can do more of this for themselves. Um, um, I, I have many colleagues who have coached people for a long time. I, 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 I've, I've generally not because then I feel like they've depended too much on me. And I'm happiest when clients leave and say, thank you, I'm done now. I, I got it from here. Um, and so um, that just keeps me kind of grounded back in my seat, not trying to lean in and make things happen or do things for my clients, but notice them and be strong for them so they can activate this um, in themselves. Okay, so I'm going to um, just stop there for a minute and see kind of what's coming up for you about all this and, um, and anything you'd like to share or ask or wonder, um, and then we'll talk a bit about the program itself. Okay, well, I have, a, I'm wondering if you could speak to this. It's kind of a, a simple question, but let's say somebody comes to you as a coach mm -hmm. and their goal is that they want to, you know, they want to finally take off, you know, 20 pounds. Okay. You know, it seems like that's a real goal, goal oriented kind of thing. You know, I want to lose 20 pounds. Hmm. And so where do you, I mean, where do you go with that? Um, great question. I have, and I have a great answer for that. So um, I don't think we have anybody from Australia here, but um, so uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, some of you might know from the coaching literature, Tony Grant, who passed away a few years ago, was the king of goals. And one of my favorite things in, I ever did in my life was we, one of the psychological associations sponsored a debate between Tony and I about goals and he, he was a character and we uh, we were a sort of wonderful frenemies um and uh the place was packed because people were wanting to see who's going to win this battle and but um the, the, my answer to your question comes from tony um he had, a, he had the first master's in degree in coaching in the world in, the, in sydney and um but his students kept saying this is all great stuff but what we how do we do with people and Tony said, well, I don't know about people. I just know about coaching. That, that was his sort of way. He's very funny. He was very funny. So uh, he basically hired me to come in for a day and talk about the human side of coaching. And we had a woman in the class who said they were daring. They, they dared me to try to coach about goals. And so she said, I've just had my second child and I have about five or 10 pounds that I haven't been able to take back off after the pregnancy. How do I do that? So your, your exact question in a way, Betty. So the long, the short answer to, to your question and to her was, um, uh, so we just positioned those 10 pounds, it would have, I think it was five pounds. Those five pounds is a story. So tell me about the five pounds. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I feel like I should get back to where I was. And, and so then we just started, we just had a, like a seven or eight minute conversation about five pounds. And, um, and what she, and the ultimate outcome was that she had taken on this social norm that I should be back to where I was and I should hide the in some ways hide the fact that I've had children and I should fit right back into where I was before. And so 
And, and at the end, she just jumped up. I'm fine the way I am. <laughs> and went and sat down again. And so you could have 50 people in a room, all there to lose weight. But the story that they tell about their weight, the journey they need to go on about their weight is going to be different for each of them. Mm -hmm. And so it could be things like, and so we would, um, in narrative coaching, if I don't get many of those types of clients, but when I do, um, I, I try to help them articulate. So what creates challenge for you around weight? Is it around food? Is it around exercise? Is it around mindset? What, what, and so we would just help them deconstruct a day. Like, what, what are you doing during your day that contributes to your issue with weight or your question about weight? And it might be, I just can't get motivated to exercise. And I said, uh, and so then we might look at what the, the set up of their house, where the equipment is that they would need to do whatever they want to do. We take them into the moment in time when they're wanting to go do exercise. What's happening for you in that moment in time? What are you aware of about yourself? Oh, I was always the fat kid, and I was always the last one picked at school for teams because nobody wanted me on their team because I was too slow. Um, or everybody else in my family is really successful, and I'm not, and I feel ashamed of myself when, and so I just don't even bother trying. Or you know, or all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Or I don't, have, I don't have enough joy in my life, and so I eat sweet food. Um, and so it's not always that simple, but it's we try to not we take that as it is. Mm -hmm. I'm, I I want to lose weight. But we don't go after helping them solve. There's no problem with their weight. There's a problem with their story about their weight. And so well, I've just and, uh, found for me, helping people understand sort of destigmatizing their scenario and just let it be a story about the weight. Like whose story is that? Is that yours or is that somebody else's mm -hmm. story? Um, and then it gives people more agency to, to make their own choices about what they're going to do. Because, um, and, and the problem for most of us in the West is we have this obsession with willpower. We'll just eat less or get out there and do that. Willpower is profoundly weak in the face of stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm not, the willpower is useful when we're in service of things that we're already wanting to do. But to get over that hump into that space, for me, I find stories really helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That keeps thinking. Was that Jackie's thinking? Yeah, Jackie's thinking. I thought you said, uh, I thought you said Becky, and then I had a story oh. about it. It can't <laughs> possibly be Jackie. It must be Becky. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about two things. I was thinking about when clients come without really knowing why they're there. But I was also thinking about the somatic piece and how mm. hard it is for so many of us, me included, to feel, to actually access what mm -hmm. I'm aware of, including sensations in the body. Yeah. So that, those were the two things I was thinking. Okay. Um, if I just could say a few, so I would say every client comes not knowing what they really want. Even ones that say that they know what they want, they don't. Um, and we never coaching conversations almost never end where they started because we just get to discover what the real issue actually is, which is part of our main job in the beginning. Um, and in terms of the second question, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, I, I think the pandemic cost us more than we realized in terms of our awareness of ourself. Um, so I've had, I've had, I was, I did fine during the pandemic and got, and I've all my COVID tests are negative, but near as I can tell, I've had long COVID since January. I have some days where I can barely do anything and other days I'm fine. Um, but I, one of the things I've noticed in all the, all the, and I had a whole bunch of things happened because of that. But one of the things I noticed was I lost touch with my own experience. And, and so a lot of what we're doing, again, if, 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 if it's like I'm not very interested in aha moments in coaching because that's in your brain. And I want things in your body because you don't remember what was in your brain. Um, and if it's not grounded, then people leave with these interesting insights, but then don't do anything because it's not kind of in themselves. And so a lot of our work is helping, which is why we witness and reflect, is helping our clients. Oh, I didn't hit record again. Oh, well, I oh, did 
Oh, excellent. That's smarter than I thought. <laughs> um, it's always that panic as a presenter. Um, the um, A lot of our work is helping clients to come to know themselves and feel themselves and know where those where their fear lives, where their joy lives, um, how, to, how to notice when your body's reacting negatively to something that's going on. And um, that in itself is far more valuable, I find, to clients than you know, little pithy insights or whatever that often tend to evaporate. Um, all right, so can I just switch gears now? And, um, and just, you can always email us if you have other questions, but I wanna just share a little bit about um, what the program looks like. All right. Keep reverting back to here, doesn't it? Okay. <clears throat> so what's it like to be in it? No. I love it when technology is totally uncooperative. There we go. Um, what's it like to be in the program? Um, so the program occurs over nine months. Um, and there's four sessions, but not really sessions, but four weeks, you know, in each module. <clears throat> Um, the first session will be with me and we'll present you with all of the core material for that um, module. Um, and then the second week where we have a set of assignments for you to do and you can use them, not use them, adapt them, whatever works for you. So there are ways um, for you to, there's a personal kind of stretch assignment with something you can like journal about and do on your own. And there's a field assignment to help you get out and start noticing what's happening around you. The problem, we tried to, I, I model the program around the narrative coaching model. So as I've, as all my programs are designed around the narrative coaching model. Um, so the second one you, you'll learn in the program is called search. And so rather than continue to pro provide you with more stuff, you'll be sort of sent on a mission with some things from the initiation session to go try them out and explore them and see what you discover. So you've got your own invested uh, lived experience in this yourself um, to try some things out. It's not about performance. It's not about mastery. It's not about anything other than go explore. And then the third week, you'll come back for a session with one of our two faculty, either Allison or Vicky, depending on what time of the day you come. Um, and this will be a chance to talk about what you did like your reflections on what you did, maybe some further practices in the session, um, kind of what didn't work for you or didn't make as much sense as you thought. So you can get clearer about that before you leave. And they're both have been doing this for a while and they're, they're, they're great at this. Um, it's sometimes, um, I'm grateful for them because sometimes it's hard for me to do those sessions because I've been at this for a long time. So I've forgotten how I got here. And so I don't know what it's like to be a beginner anymore. I can't not know narrative coaching, it's in my bones. So it's harder for me sometimes to answer some kinds of questions. These two are very good at what they do in narrative coaching and are closer to where you are to make it easier for them to answer some of your questions. And then we're, um, we will divide you up into pods of around four or five people by sort of time zone. So it makes it easier to schedule. Um, we, one of the things that's really exciting for next year for the first time is we're partnering with one of our vendors. Uh, I've served as an advisor to them and they've created a platform um, through which you can record yourself practicing and get feedback. And so we're going to give you all, uh, it's, it's an essential part of our practice groups for graduates now, <clears throat> but we're going to integrate it into the program and give you a chance to rather than just practice um, but actually to be recorded uh, on your practice and be able to give feedback to each other, we found that it just really accelerates your ability to grow as a coach if you can see yourself in action. And after about the first two or one or two times, you forget the platform's even there, you're just talking because it's recorded right there and all the rest drops away. But we, we what we heard from participants was they wanted more space and scaffolding to practice. So they felt more confident about using some of the skills. So that'll be part of it um, that last week. Um, and then we'll um, come back following week or in a couple weeks after that and, and start over the next uh, module. Um, so just if you wanna know kind of some people like, you know, to know what we're studying. So 
the first three modules are all about um, the narrative coaching mindset. Um, and again, this is the personal and spiritual development for yourself to be able to work this way. Um, some people, um, it's a novel idea to kind of work without so, so much net netting or scaffolding. Um, so we want to show you kind of how to, how to be in that kind of mindset. Um, the second um, set is about the, um, oh, I didn't even change the headers. Oh, what is that? A note to self, proof your own things. Um, so the third one, so it should say narrative coaching process. I'll fix that before this afternoon. Um, and it's all about the, the intricacies of how does this narrative coaching process actually work? And this is where we start to uh, bring in the learning development theory that's here, as well as a lot of very specific things about stories themselves um, and uh, the unique way in which we work with stories. And then the last one are, are specific narrative coaching skills. So we have uh, some very um, powerful, I think, um, takes on listening, um, asking narrative-based questions, and then how do you help people achieve their outcomes without having to set goals? Um, and then we have a wonderful celebration is, is actually tomorrow for this cohort. And um, it's a chance for people to share what was most important for them um, about their journey. Um, in the um, just the last piece here, and then we'll stop and see what questions you have. So these are all the things that come with the program. You can use as much or little as you, you want. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to see if anything that's new for that. So again, um, all the sessions are offered uh, twice a day um, at, at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so you're welcome to come to one or both. All of them are recorded. So if you're away on holiday or can't come that day at all, um, you can always watch them later. Um, we have a wonderful online forum. This, this year's was particularly robust. We have a new platform which makes it easier to communicate. So people were quite engaged. We had a, a couple of people with some tragedies in their life during the program and, and they commented about how deeply they appreciated um, the support from the other students. Um, we are building a much larger alumni network, so that will be in, is in the works. And we offer um, 53 credit hours. Um, so if you're applying for things like ICF and whatnot, we're not an ICF certified provider on purpose, uh, but you can use them as, I think they're called resource hours or something. Um, and people have for years have been able to use those towards um, their associations and systems. Um, and then just kind of the larger picture. So, we are we just um we've run two pilots this year and we're launching it in january ongoing practice groups on the platform to get better and better at what you do we'll start an advanced certification program later in the year next year as well as some master classes and like i said um, finding ways to increase your connections to others around the world who have graduated from the narrative coaching program all right so that's sort of a high level view of kind of what it's like to be in the program. Um, and um, I just want to see um, if you have any questions or thoughts. But what, Betty? Yeah, uh, the question I had was like in, in week two of the module where it's immersion. Yeah. Is that a week where you don't really meet with anybody? I mean, is, is that... Yes, no, that's you on your own doing what's specifically important to you about that topic. Okay. And so we, we you you have two assignments. Like I said, you can use them, not use them. Many people change them slightly to make it fit their situation. Um, you could choose to do something else altogether because that's what you need. So part of it is um, um, we're we're not trying to say here's the mold of narrative coaching and you have to conform yourself to that mold. So it's this is a philosophy of coaching. This is a grounded piece of work on effective strategies for helping clients change. It's a lot of things. And this will be a very personal journey for you, each of you. And so the the, re the assignments, there's no obligation to do any of them. Um, if, 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 and particularly if on a given week, it doesn't really resonate for you, make up your own. Um, it's totally fine. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Other questions or thoughts? Ma, I'm feeling like it's really exciting. Something's happening in my body. 
uh, like a moving towards. Yeah. And is, is it a Tuesday, a practical question? Yes, they're all on Tuesday. Great, yeah. thank you. Thanks for what you're doing today as well. I appreciate yeah. this. It's just been a really enriching experience as well. So. Yeah. so this is what it feels like to be in the program. Yeah. Judy, are you guys? Oh, Betty, go ahead. I just want to follow a question. I just want to, how long is, is the actual meeting time? 90 like, minutes. What? 90, 90 oh, so minutes. it's just like today. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. And it will feel kind of like this. Yeah, Rima. I want to ask about the other program. In other words, how are they related? Is this the one, you know, like, I don't know which one to go into or what, how, what, how they're related. Um, we have nine minutes. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, so I, I started, I created narrative coaching out of my PhD about 20, 25 years ago. And, um, and then, but I was at the time doing a lot of large scale organizational change projects for the government, for big governments, big companies. And um, they kept asking me, can you scale narrative coaching? And I said, well, not really. Um, but, I, I, you know, they were very curious, like they, they enjoyed that philosophy in some of the programs we were teaching. And, and so I began to, um, in these projects, I um, often would get these huge IT projects, even though I'm not an IT expert, but I could talk to various kinds of players in those projects in ways that most people can't. So I won a lot of projects away from IT consulting companies for that reason. And when I started to kind of notice which one, I was kind of reflecting uh, which ones were actually working really well. And they were all ones in which I was allowed to just be David. And I might have 10 different hats in a given day, in a given meeting. I could be negotiating with the governor, I could be talking to server builders, I could be out in some rural town talking to frontline workers. Um, and, I, and so I, um, I had an invitation uh, to uh, come teach my coaching skills to um, a large organization that served disabled children and their families. And they said, we'd like to pay, you know, run a narrative coaching program for everybody. And I said, I, I won't do that. And like, what do you mean you won't do that? I said, because I know how hard it was for you to get that grant for this money. And I don't think it'll give you what you want. She goes, well, what are you going to do instead? And I said, I don't know. But give me an overnight. I'll go figure that out. And so I went home and I cobbled together all the best parts of all the other big projects I had done. And I developed ID that night in, in a way from my, I'm very good at mapping and figuring things out. And, um, and so I came back and offered her this proposal and she goes, wow, that sounds amazing. So I spent two, two years with them and rebuilt their organization with them from top to bottom. We did almost no training and coaching. Um, and evolved a way of working that was profound. And so then people said, can you teach us this? And I said, I don't know, I'm just doing this. I'm just being David. So then I had to go back to the literature and start you know, building that all the way back up. So it's a long way of saying it's the learning and development theory that's been in narrative coaching the whole time. It's the philosophy, the pedagogy of how we think of things, um, but it's freed from the container of coaching. So the way I describe this is we can notice and liberate the learning and development potential in any moment in time. Um, you know, and I, the example I would use um, is when I went to Germany last year for Christmas, it was a massive blizzard came in unexpectedly um, and they lost my suitcase. And you can go through all that morass in the airport with tens of thousands of people stranded and Everybody's yelling at the baggage people who have no power to do anything. And I just, I was able to kind of move through this in a very deeply spiritual way and almost, and I didn't get my suitcase, but I made a lot of friends along the way and I found out how the system really works and I got allies and, and I was and I had a great peace of mind and slept that night where the rest of them were still back at the airport screaming at the baggage people. Um, and I just said, I, believe, I, I trust that the bag will come back, which it did a month later. Um, and uh, so ID basically uh, allows, it's, it's a, the learning development theory will teach that to you in a very variety of forms, but it's largely for, you can use this in coaching, but it's useful in whether you're a facilitator, a trainer, uh, an OD consultant, 
Um, I haven't done, I used to do a lot of MBA courses and teach. I used to run lead, major lead, uh, leadership programs and I haven't done them in probably eight years. I don't know, I'll never do them again. They're, I feel like they're a waste of money and time, um, even with the good ones, um, because um, it's not how humans naturally learn. And so I want to help, um, I've just become much more practical about this. Um, what can this person, uh, what are they ready for right now? That's all I'm interested in. And that's gonna be different for each people, person. And so it kind of depends, you know, narrative, we don't do a lot of story work in ID, hardly any at all, actually. Um, so narrative coaching is probably more intimate. You know, it's more, you can use it at, in other contexts besides coaching, but it was largely designed to um, evolve coaching. Whereas ID is more of the, um, philosophy of this work and more of um, so we spend a lot more time on the spiritual philosophy of this like what are some of the assumptions we make about people about change about life um and um yeah i love it so justine is there anything you'd like to add i mean i want to put you on the spot but is there anything you'd like to add about what you're what you think id means for you mm -hmm. Something I really appreciate about the ID way <clears throat> is really um, going inward for mm -hmm. myself and my own personal development um, and, and how that relates to others and the slowing down. Something that I really have been focusing on, I guess for weeks now, is mm -hmm. the, um, the stating of what is mm -hmm. and how beneficial that is to apply in so many areas of every day so many times throughout the day all day if you just slow down and, and think about what is what is true in this moment mm. it's just such a a life changer and um i've been sharing it with everyone and and i talk about it a, a lot and hope to just keep strengthening that muscle mm. And um, working with you is is wonderful. And I always walk away feeling more grounded and focused and present after these mm. sessions. And mm. uh, the breakout pods that David mentioned are, are very nourishing and mm. being able to be in a group with everyone in the and that's going through the same program is is very beneficial. Mm. And you learn so much. Mm. And I, I just, I really enjoy all of the work that we're doing. Thank you. Remind me of where you're getting, you are in Oklahoma? Tulsa. Okay. Now, Carolyn is one of our faculty members, is actually in Lawton today. Oh, okay. I was and, there um, last month doing yeah. some <laughs> yeah, she's um She uh, has a long background in museums and the arts, and so the Oklahoma Arts Council is having some giant event, and she's doing ID with them for three days. Oh, lovely. <laughs> uh, in Oklahoma, of all places, it's great. Yeah. All right. So I just, we just have a couple more minutes, but I just want to share one more slide with you. So it'll be, um, um, here we go. So, um, so we, a, a registration, early bird registration opens actually tomorrow. And so if you get yourself on the list, um, this uh, will be true for both programs, but uh, you can um, just, um, I can uh, I can put this link in the chat box um, so you can just grab it. <clears throat> but if you, if, if you sign up for our um, sort of interest list in the program that you want to take, you, you get an early bird sort of coupon that allows you to um, save some money. So if that interests you, if you like saving money, um, there it is. Um, then just do that today and then you'll get a coupon code when it comes time to register for the program. All right, so I'm just gonna take this down and just see if there's any final reflections before we call it a day. Yeah, Betty. Yeah, I, I remember reading somewhere that this is gonna be the last year that you're doing the narrative coaching program. Does that mean you, you won't be doing coaching anymore? Well, I haven't done coaching for years, but um, no. But I mean, <laughs> you won't be running that program. No, so we're um, uh, so we're we're moving towards uh, a, a variety of things. So I I, I just um, especially being sick all year, I I've, I'm behind on 
some writing projects that are really personally very important to me and and, and so the next piece of where the work is going um and um I love I love teaching. I've taught all my life, but um, uh, running a business that supports teaching is a lot of work, mm -hmm. and it's not giving me the time I need to write. And um, the world's get, we're all getting busier, and so we're make, we're, we're turning this into a self directed program, but with peer peer support and um, a variety of other things. So the material will live on. You know that so we'll continue to offer that. We'll continue to work with our advanced certification program. We will continue to support and mentor people in the practice groups. Um, I'll, I will show up um, some to the people uh, in the self-directed program, which allows you to sign up whenever you want. Um, and I just need to um, do other things to support the business and support my writing. And um, actually, um, yeah, so this is the last year um, that will be teaching it in this way. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Well, this week there's I just a. Want to say thank you. Yeah. What's that? I just said I want to say thank you. It was a pleasure participating. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, and I hope you come and join us. And the uh, email for our support people is at the bottom of the screen there. Um, if you, oh, I didn't, I'm not sharing the screen anymore. But um, it's um, just right here. Um, and you can um, just reach out if you have more questions. Otherwise, sign up on the list, save yourself some money, and I hope you'll come and join us in January. All right? All right. Be well, my friends, and uh, until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.